If you're ready to explore some more of Oregon's top northwest corner, come along today for Oregon video map number three. So far we've gone from Fort Stevens to St. Helens and now we're headed into some of the more remote places where tourists don't usually go. South from St. Helens, you go through Warren to Scapoose. Then a right turn takes you to Spitzenberg and Chapman, Yankton, Trenholm, and an old map shows there is once a town here named Willark. Then on up to Apery and Hudson Park, just before you come back onto Highway 30 at Alston. Warren consists of just an old schoolhouse with a newer addition built on in the front. From there on south is Scapoose. Now Scapoose is an Indian word meaning gravely plain. Hudson's Bay Company had a farm and a trading post here in the 1830s. Nothing much has ever happened here since that time. A post office was opened in 1872. Scapoose is now a city of 3,500 people. Scapoose's antique city hall building was built in 1902. Five miles northwest of here is Spitzenberg. And in a couple miles to the west is the remains of Chapman. This house isn't too bad, but the school's in bad need of repair. Then going northeast from Spitzenberg is this old castle type house. And after six miles you come to Yankton. It's kind of a picturesque old town with its old houses, an old church, a store, and even a school. It kind of looks just like a typical town would have looked about 40 or 50 years ago. Next, after you travel about six miles to the west, there's a nice sign announcing the city of Trenholm. But instead of a town, as you would think, there's only a few houses and a big barn left here. Then over the hill from the barn is an old abandoned building, and that's all that's left of the old town of Willark. It's kind of pretty out here, though. Then back at Trenholm, there's an old abandoned house plus about five or six that are occupied. Headed back north again, the road is paved for about five miles and then gravel for about eight miles before hitting another paved road that runs into Apery. The community of Apri consists of this old school that's been restored into a very nice house. Plus there's a few other houses here and along the road in both directions. The old community of Hudson is just five miles to the north and from there it's only another mile or so to Highway 30 and modern civilization. Oh, 
is the town here. The community of Hudson is right across from Rainier's new high school. It's got a campground with picnic and playground facilities, a Hudson Park Baptist Church, two cemeteries, and a Victory Baptist Church, all in the same area. Now, since we finished this loop from Scapoos to Hudson, we're heading south again through Holbrook or Burlington to Savi Island and then Portland. Going south from Scapoos, the road has more traffic, but it also has four lanes all the way into Portland. There wasn't any sign of a town called Holbrook, but there is a sign announcing Burlington. So maybe they just changed the name of this small town sometime since the maps were printed. In a couple miles more you come to the bridge that crosses over onto Savi Island. It's the biggest island on the Columbia River, about 13 miles long with a few lakes and even a couple of private beaches. We're going to visit one of them.
Portland, Oregon's largest city, is getting near 400,000 people. From Portland, we're going west to Cedar Hills, then Cedar Mill, Bethany, West Union, Helvetia, North Plains, Shady Brook, Mountaindale, and Manning. Cedar Hills is a nice exclusive housing area in the Portland foothills, while Cedar Mill is a small town, and it's located just at the west end of Portland's Cornell Road. You might notice it says Cornell Plaza on one of the shopping center signs. And Bethany, the next town, has a big high school and a fancy church but it's still close enough to be part of Portland's suburbs. When you get to West Union, you're about to the end of the suburbs. And from here on, signs of the country start appearing, like barns and deserted places of Oregon's earlier days. West Union also has a historic Old Baptist Church and cemetery that is quite picturesque. Just a little north of here there's still a tavern and hamburger grill in the Swiss settlement of Helvetia. The streets are all Swiss words that I can't pronounce, but it is a nice country community. On to the west, the wheat fields provide a welcome dinner for the blackbirds. The town of North Plains has a population of around 700 or so. This is the old part of town, and there's a few more businesses out by the Sunset Highway. Probably many of the inhabitants of this town work at the lumber mill three miles to the north, where the town of Shady Brook once stood. When you go north of town here, there's more wheat fields and a fancy old house that we saw along the road. At Shady Brook, there's the operating mill, plus a few houses where probably some of the workers may live at. On about three miles to the west of here is an old place called Mountaindale, which seems to be a forgotten old town that looks almost like a ghost town. But the store is still open, as you can see by the open front door on it and the locals still come here to buy their supplies. This village even has a payphone here, so in case you think you're lost, you could call and see if you could get some help to find your way back to the highway. There's a fancy old house here with some gingerbread trim. Then when you get back to the Sunset Highway, there's a small settlement, and then the town of Manning. After Manning, Highway 47 turns off at Buxton. We're going north to Treharn, Vernonia, Kesey, Pittsburgh, Big Eddy Park, and Mist. The town of Buxton is a little more than a wide spot in the road, a stop for truckers on their busy way through. Highway 47 starts here and winds its way north to Vernonia. Since this was once a major logging center with the biggest all-electric sawmill of its day, there are still houses all along the road. This is a nice scenic drive that is missed by the tourists because it's in the middle of nowhere and not on any main road. Usually only those who live around here travel this road. 
it's a place where a few strangers are seen. There's three or four railroad overpasses, but the last train to pass this way was back in 1969. Pretty soon we'll come to a very high trestle overpass. It looks a little rickety, but when you come back from the other way, you'll notice that it's only half there. I sure wouldn't want to try a train ride into this town today. There must still be a little bit of logging left too because of the logging trucks that travel this road. Also there's a forest that's been replanted and the sign says in 1984 that you'll see pretty soon. Treharn is the first town that you come to after 12 miles of curvy road. Then after crossing the Nehalem River, you arrive at Vernonia. This is really a good sized town for being in such a remote place. There's still probably around 1700 people who call this their home. The Anderson City Park has adequate facilities for campers and picnickers as well. Their open air transportation park by the river has some interesting old relics, including the steam engine that was formerly the Kesey Express. And on the other side of the road, there's an engineering feat that's a real money saver. Just a small dam on the Nehalem River makes a good sized city swimming pool. Some of the buildings in town were moved here from Kesey after its mill shut down. Then Vernonia's mill shut down. Because of a lack of visitors to this place the hotels now closed permanently. Vernonia didn't die though. It's still a very desirable town to live in for people who like to live in Oregon's remote corners. Ten miles up this country road is where the town of Kesey once stood. Today, there's nothing left but farms and lovely country scenery. Let's just take a little drive over there and see. After coming back to Vernonia, we're now heading north toward Mist. After driving five miles, you come to Pittsburgh, 
which is just a restaurant and a state vehicle parking lot. In another three miles further up the road is Big Eddy Park, which has picnicking, camping, and even a boat launch. Then on up the road during the next eight winding country miles, you go by an old grange and a school and a few more houses. This is what looks like a friendly little country town. For a small country store, you can find most anything here. If I lived here, I'd probably want to avoid too many trips over the winding roads into Vernonia and Klatskanine myself, so I'd probably do some shopping right here. Heading west from Mist on Highway 202, you pass the road to Fishhawk Lake, then Birkenfield, Vesper, Jewel, Jewel Meadows, Fishhawk Falls County Park, Olney, Young's River Falls, Miles Crossing, Melville, and Gearhart. About four miles west of Mist, is a road that turns off to Fishhawk Lake. The first farm on the way is this big dairy or cattle ranch. Do you see a cat on the wagon seat? Fishhawk Lake is a privately owned lake so they probably wouldn't let you throw in a line until you paid the necessary fee. It is a very peaceful and quiet place though.
A German man by the name of Anton Birkenfield started this town around 1910. It also has an interesting looking old store, so we might just as well take a look inside while getting a few snacks for lunch for the journey ahead. That's about all that we have time for today. Join me again next month as we see more of Birkenfield, the coast, and the rest of Oregon's top northwest corner in part four of my Oregon video map number one. Come back next week to explore more of northwest Oregon. In our next journey, we'll see Jules Elk Refuge, the Young's River Falls, and Seaside. <laughs>